I believe that the chance to talk to you about the anti-Semitism and uh, control and eradication here. This is a topic of great interest in, I would say, in many countries, especially in developed countries. And we need to look at how this is going to impact you know, the industry here. Uh, can I have a show of hands if there's any consumers here, or most of you are food producers? Okay. Right. Uh, let's start off with some basic information here, and we are looking at salmonella here. If you look at salmonella, right, I, there are many ways that people would actually categorize them. But as a vet, and as looking at this disease, I would like to categorize them in two ways. One is what we call as host-specific. Salmonella, and then there's a non-host specific. What we mean by host specific is that it causes a systemic disease in, in, in the host. It's not a public health issue and causes economic loss to the producer. And some examples, here you have Salmonella pleurum, Gallinarum, and so on. So if you're in the, if you're in the poultry field and you've been in the poultry field for a very, very long time, you, you knew that there was once that we were trying to control salmonella pleuro, right? But it's a chicken disease. That's it. Finish. If we control it, you know, everything is okay. It does not affect public health. It does not affect, you know, human beings. You know? We control it because we were losing money if we had pleuro in our flocks. Right? Now, but this is not our issue today, or not my topic today. And, uh, the topic that I'm going to talk to you about is this non-specific uh, group of salmonella. They have a wide range of hosts and they affect both humans and animals, and that's where our problem is. It causes an inapparent and clinical disease, mostly inapparent, and it's foodborne. It, it causes a foodborne disease. Of course, we have ST, salmonella enteritidis, and salmonella trichimurium. Okay? So, what's interesting here is the wide range of hosts, number one. And number two, it's inapparent. Which means that in the chicken, right, actually it doesn't cause much of a problem. It's just that. Unless there's a very heavy infection of SE in the younger birds, in the chicks, you should see nothing. Generally, it's just that. So, it's not a problem is not a disease problem in the flocks. The, 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 the importance of this is in the human being, not in the chickens, huh? unlike your plural. So this is a point I'd like to make clear. And if you're looking at you know, specific uh, similars, then you have similar typhi. It causes typhoid fever in humans and in humans only. I'm quite sure that uh, if you go back uh, and look at the newspapers and on and off, you've got typhoid fever happening, right? Typhoid outbreak in Malaysia. I think the last one was in East Coast. Huh? Uh, and it remains very important in developing countries. And typhoid fever is specific to humans, right? It's human passing to another human. So what we have here is the carrier being a human, uh, a person. Very often, the person who prepares the food and he can be a carrier of the disease. Right, so we are looking at that. A little bit about the infection in human beings. If you look, you, someone takes contaminated food and drinks, bacteria travels to the intestine, causes, causes uh, it may multiply and may go into the bloodstream, but in most cases, you get nausea, vomiting, fever, diarrhea, abdominal cramps. Most people recover without any problem. Okay? Most people recover without any problem. Some who are immunos uh, who's immunosuppressed, like infants or elderly people, they may get a systemic disease which is more dangerous and that may cause some mortality. Right? And then they will need treatment. Now, if generally the population gets only this, they recover. And, uh, when I was looking at this, I said, okay, in that context, in that context and in Malaysia context, right? Now, how important is this to us? It is important, but for us, right? How many of us in a year get something like this 
that remains undiagnosed, right? We go somewhere, mama store, we eat, and then we go back, and then tomorrow we don't feel so well, and two days later we are quite fine. Nobody knows what we have. We had some foodborne diseases, and uh, what the contribution factor said, ah, we are unlucky. We ate the wrong thing that day. That's all. And that's it. That's over. And I'm going to show you later on some, some results that are uh, uh, some data that I've tried to. But basically, it's it is just a a, a a disease where you know you get you get. Uh, these symptoms of diarrhea vomiting and most people recover. Now, the bacteria is a gram negative bacteria here. Uh, it's got a long flagella, so it's more tough, right? And it, it's quite resistant. It survives uh, away from the host for quite some time. Right. Let's look at the zoonotic formula epidemiology. This is sort of important to, to understand these few little points and then if you are trying to control or eradicate salmonella in the farm, then it sort of makes it all very logical. The first thing is that again, it's a common asymptomatic colonization of the chicken gut. It grows in the chicken gut, it causes no problem in the chicken, right? Chicken grows, your SCR is still good, everything is still good. So it's not a problem in the flock. That's the first thing. So if so, so you begin to see the difficulty with farmers. It's not a problem in the flock. Why would I bother to do anything and you know, put out money to do something about it? It's not a problem. Huh? Secondly, unfortunately, chicken and chicken products are the most frequent source of zoonosis in terms of people getting similar enteritis infection or similar pacumerum infection, a lot of it is traced back to chicken and chicken products. What does it mean? It's, but it doesn't mean it's only chicken. You can get it from eating pork, you can get it from eating beef, you can even get it from eating vegetables or peanut butter or just about everything because it contaminates all your environment. So be very, be, be, no, very aware of that. It's not all about chicken here, but chicken has been identified as a source of high salmonella concentration. Eggs, you get contamination. Most of it is actually in the egg. I saw that we are talking about broilers here, so... Uh, but broilers have not been identified as a, a, a big issue. But eggs is definitely the, the important thing. You get shell contamination, right, or salmonella. Remember, it's in the gut, right? Feces comes out from the cloaca. Where does the egg come up from? Cloaca as well. So, when the egg comes out, goes through the cloaca, gets contaminated with feces, feces has salmonella, you got salmonella on the eggshell, right? And it gets inside. SE actually can actually get into the eggs, even not from eggshell contamination. That means it, it, it gets, the bird, the ovary of the bird gets infected, and it, it, is, it contaminates the egg yolk. So, it, you have an internal contamination, not an external contamination, right? And ST and ST are the most important ones, as far as poultry is concerned. There are others, you're going to hear some like uh, uh, Virchow, right? And so on. But the most important today is SD and ST. And in many countries, this is where it's targeted in terms of control. Right. This is important because again, how we're going to control it, it's got many biological reservoirs and vectors. It makes it very difficult for you to control, right? And I'm going to show you some pictures later. It's resistant in the environment, feed can be a source of contamination. Very often it is a source of contamination. And you have a vertical transmission and as well as a, uh, as well as actually a horizontal transmission. That means that if you are getting chips that do not come from a similar free breeder flock, you get transmission. So I receive chicks from a flock that's not salmonella free. Ten percent of them have salmonella, very soon my whole flock gets salmonella. Because then I get horizontal transmission. So that's vertical as well as horizontal. Right? Now, so here it is, vertical and trans uh, and horizontal transmission. Uh, this is a general um, diagram to show where you can get uh, 
transmission of salmonella from food, environment, feed, and so on. Uh, don't look too much on this. It's just to impress you that it's very difficult to control. It's everywhere. It's in the environment, it's in the food, it's everywhere, right? Okay? But uh, more important to us, who are veterinarians, is looking at how does the farm get contaminated. I mentioned to you a little bit about feed already. But first, most important thing is chicks. You've got to have your chicks free. If your chicks are not free, you know, it's futile trying to control salmonella in your farm. You'll never be able to eradicate if you've got your chicks that are not free. So which means it goes up. It goes up to your PS. It goes up to your DP. They must be free before you, you try and do anything. And then you've got people going in, traffic, in and out of the farms. You have to think about that. Your feet that's going in. In readers, you've got spiking mills. You've got the, they can introduce something else. You've got insects. Rodents are very important. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And you also have other animals. Uh, some of you may be wondering, you know, what other animals are there. Uh, I'll show you some pictures. And they also come from wild birds. Okay? But what, what I like to point out here is that you begin to see with SE or ST, the non host specific, you know, all these species, including human, that can bring some into the farm. And as you can see the arrow, it goes both ways. The chickens can infect the other way around, right? And so you see how it's going to spread. So if you can appreciate this, this, this uh, diagram here, then you begin to see that trying to control salmonella in the in, in a farm is not an easy task, or, or trying to eradicate salmonella from the farm is not an easy task, right? So what can we do? So the main objective of controlling uh, SD is actually to minimize or eliminate the risk of contamination of poultry, meat, and eggs. Okay. Again, it's a public health thing. You're trying to do to control contamination of food products. You can either minimize it as much as possible or eliminate it. That means it's salmonella free. Right? But everything has a cost. So that's where the producers come in, whether we do anything about it or not. Okay? So let's look at different levels of intervention here. And here, I'm talking about farm intervention, the level where we producers are and what we can do in the farm. The first thing, salmonella free chicks. Again, the same thing. If you don't get salmonella free chicks, or you don't get chicks from a certified salmonella free breeder, you know, you're not going to win the battle. Right? You need to look at traffic, pick trucks, visitors coming in. They are all carriers, they can be vectors, they are, it can be equipment. Salmonella is out in the environment. You can get them coming in as well. Employees, uh, in many places, employees work for the day, go home, easily gets contaminated. In a lot of cultures here, they like to keep a few chickens at home. Uh, maybe they don't keep any more chickens where they have a, where, where, where they, it's a food source, but many people like to keep game birds. Right? It can be birds, game birds, fighting cocks. But in this case, it can even be there are what the, those birds that sing and so on because all of them can carry some nerve. Okay? It can be any species of bird. Right. Uh, this is a picture. I'm sorry it's not so clear with all these lights here, but you see some goats here is actually inside a chicken farm. Okay? It's actually inside a chicken farm. Um, very good use of the land, but then in terms of controlling salmonella, not a good idea because they can be carrying salmonella, exchanging salmonella with the pollution, right? Uh, okay, you, you obviously can see some chickens here, but if you look carefully, you see a dog here, right? Again, problem because again, this multi species bacteria can can be anywhere. Got dogs running in there. And, 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 and he goes to this farm and he says, Why are you keeping dogs here? 
oh, it's very important. That's for security purposes, right? Huh? In a lot of farms, it's security. It, 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 it's a necessity to have dogs inside the farm in some, some places, right? So this is obviously um, one of the risks of having dogs or any other uh, animals in the farm. We do cleaning and disinfection, all in all out, it's a standard procedure, but in a lot of places it's not all in all out. Boilers, much easier to do all in all out. Many people try to do it, don't do it well, downtime is too short, right, and so on. But in layers, in a way that is almost impossible in our area, right? right? because of the market that we are doing, uh, 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 the supply, we don't do all in all. We have multi, uh, multi age farms. So here is a salmonella which contaminates everything, environment, uh, rodents, and so on, and you don't do all in all out. How can you ever get rid of that bacteria? Because it's going to go from one flock to another flock, to another flock, you call this flock, you bring new flock in, the old flock are going to contaminate the new flock, and so you, 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 you're just breeding some nerva in that in, in, in that farm. Okay? So this is one thing that we need to look at. Rodents. We need to keep the farm surroundings clean. Right? No debris, no vegetation to harbor pests. You know all these rodents, what they, where do they hide? They either hide up there or they, go, they burrow into the ground. And if your environment is not clean, you're going to have rodents and they are going to just spread salmonella. You need to control vermin huh? and have levels and take appropriate steps. Now, uh, a few words about rodent control, practical steps about rodent control here, is that, um, well, let's hope that you have a rodent control in the first place. Huh? You don't the control in the first place. If you get into the farm in the morning and you, you collect eggs, you see no rodents, right? Everything is clean. No rodents. But I think you should go in at night and use a flashlight and then you start seeing rodents. Right? If you're going to catch rodents, go in at night. And then you start seeing, okay, this guy is climbing up because if you put a trap in the wrong place, you don't, you don't catch rodents. Go in at night and then you begin to see. That's the first thing, right? The second thing also is in a multi age farm, and you're going to try and control and, and let's say you've got several houses. Huh? You have several houses and you're going to clean off one, one house. And uh, you're doing a salmonella control. And uh, you need to get rid of the rodents, right? You need to do your rodent control intensively before you depopulate that, farm, that house. Okay? That's very important. And I'll tell you the reason why. The reason is that if you depopulate that, that flock, right, and then do your rodent control, it's too late. When you depopulate that flock and take all the feed, what does the rodent do? It goes to the next house. Right? The rodents will move because you remove all the feed. The guy has nothing to eat. He goes to the next house to have feet, and then you're trying to catch rodents in the the, the, the the house that has no more rodents. So you need to do rodent control in the house before you depopulate, as intensively as possible to get rid of all the rodents there. Because the rodents will move from one house to another house looking for food. Okay, so that's a tip there. Uh, they are very important. Rodents are extremely important. Why? Because they are biological vectors. And I'll show you a, a, a diagram on that to impress me on this point. Um, flies. I think even over there you can see all these dark things. These are flies. Okay. I'm sure your farms are not like that. Huh? I'm sure, but the, your neighbor's farm may be like that. So you've got big problems, right? <laughs> and uh, oh, this one doesn't move. Let me see whether I can get it to move. Um, so, just to show you that, uh, this was actually just a video to show that, you know, there are some very brave vets who try to do uh, post-mortem in this type of environment, right, with flies everywhere. 
this, this, this is the case that I did with, with some of my colleagues and uh, our final diagnosis was there was too much fly, there was too much fly in the composition of the feet. So the person was doing well, right? <laughs> right? Uh, just a joke. But here, here it is. This is a chicken house where there is no, you know, everything is cleaned up, it's gravel. So this is a good way of preventing rodents from growing in the farm. On the opposite here, you have all sorts of junk, you have tires here, so you've got, got pit bags here and so on. This is the perfect place for you, for the rodents to grow. And this will be a nightmare for you to try and control the rodents, right? You've got to get it right. Okay, why is rodents so important? Here is a uh, uh, diagram from Differ. And what you see is that they get easily infected. You can have a low level contamination in all these places, right? Whether it's in the feet, in the dust, in the dropping pits, right? Very low level contamination. What happens? Gets into the rodent, producing millions and millions of salmonella. So it's not only a vector, right? It's a multiplier. It's going to produce millions and millions of thumbna and contaminate your whole farm. So rodent is extremely important in the control of SD in the farm. And not only does it produce millions of, 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 of thumbna, it may produce many, many offspring with thumbna. Right? So you've got a big problem if you don't control rodents in the farm. See, now, contaminated raw feed, you need to do feed treatment. Why is the feed contaminated? Salmonella is everywhere. Where does the feed come from? It comes from the fields, the corn, the soya bean. It can be contaminated from that, right? In some areas, if they use uh, untreated uh, manure as a fertilizer, chances are even higher than you can get from the, in, 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 in the feed. Okay? So contamination of feed is very real. And so feed companies or feed users need to look at it. One of the ways is actually to do heat treatment, which I'll, uh, I'll um, show again. Right? We got contamination also in the feed meal. Again, there are rodents there. Right? They face the same problem as the farm faces. Of course, contamination in the farm. You've got feed going in the farm. It's not stopped properly. You've got you know, all, all this contamination going on. So feed, again, is seen as a source of important uh, infection or contamination or something like So these are just the different ways that some people will treat the feed. You can use organic acids or heat treatment or irradiation. Okay? Uh, I understand that the, the, when you do pelleting, you actually, you know, the, the, you, you actually heat the feet, right? But that, that pelleting heating may not be enough. It's not high enough, especially said, to actually kill the salmonella. Vaccination. So this is also one of the tools. Basically, in vaccination, generally, not for salmonella, you do, you want three things. You want to increase the resistance of the chicken against infection. So basically what it means is this, How do I, uh, when I increase the resistance, let's say for example it takes one million salmonella or whatever bacteria or virus to infect a chicken. When I vaccinate my chicken, it will maybe take 10 million before I, the chicken gets it. So I increase the resistance so that if there's a little bit of contamination in the environment, it's still okay. The chicken doesn't get infected because you need a lot more bugs to infect the chicken. That's the first thing we want to do. We want to prevent clinical signs and mortality, right? So that now, let's say it still gets infected. And in, a, um, in some diseases which causes clinical signs and mortality, we want to prevent that, right? Yeah, it got sick, but it didn't die. And it recovered. Farmer is happy. That's what we also want to do. And the third thing, is to reduce excretion and transmission. And this is something that a lot of farmers don't see. It's only the veterinarians and, and, and the scientists who see it. Okay, it gets infected, 
I do not want it to fall too sick, I want it to recover, but also more important is I want to reduce the shedding because a sick bird will always shed and transmit the virus or bacteria. So I want to reduce the shedding so that I can reduce transmission so that I can prevent a big outbreak. These are the three principles that when we do vaccination. But as you can see in some level, this is not important because there's no clinical science. Right? This is because it's not poultry disease. So you're basically doing these two things only when you do vaccination. Increase the distance so that the chickens don't get don't get infected, and if they do get infected, that they don't shed so much of the bacteria. And uh, I've talked already about vertical transmission as well as uh, horizontal. So vaccines, you have live vaccines available today in the market, right? Uh, they usually have a gene deletion or chemical mutagenesis. You apply two or three times of uh, vaccination. Um, when you use live vaccine, you are giving it by the oral route. And that's very important. Why? Because that's the, also the route where the field bacteria is going to go in. So that's, that, that's something very important. So it binds to the receptor sites and it has some competitive exclusion uh, properties here. And, but more important here is this, you must be able to differentiate from the field salmonella, especially in your monitoring program. Right? Extremely important. You can't have a, a good salmonella vaccine that you cannot differentiate. So all this, all, all the companies who produce a live salmonella vaccine will have something like this. You must be able and, and let me tell you why. Because if you use a live salmonella, right, in your farm, and then there's this government rule that says, you know, you've got to monitor the salmonella, and then the salmonella positive or negative, right? And you vaccinate with live vaccine. What's going to happen when the government comes and takes samples? It's going to be positive. And then, the, but this is a vaccine strain. How do you know it's a vaccine strain? So you must always be able to differentiate between the live vaccine strain from the field strain. So that even though you do a vaccination, and then you do your monitoring, you pick up salmonella, you still are able to tell between whether it's just a vaccine strain or it's a field strain. Because, because when you do monitoring, you end up saying, okay, this flock is infected. This flock has salmonella SD, right? So how do you do that if you're doing a live vaccination? Kill vaccination, it's, it's been used quite some time in the EU, it's been very successful in bringing down the cases of human uh, cases of uh, SE, right? It produces a high level of antibodies, humoral antibodies, right? And, and the USDA has shown that you no, know, it does reduce, but it does not absolutely emit, uh, not eliminate uh, vertical transmission. Now, this is just a a, a, a trial, an internal trial done in Morel. And to show that here is the percentage of ovaries infected. In this trial, what was done was we take some SPF chicks, right? We have a control group which we don't vaccinate. We have two more groups that we vaccinate with SE and ST vaccines, and then we challenge them. And 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 then uh, four days post vaccination, we kill some of the birds. We take the ovaries and we look and see whether they are infected with SE. I told you that it goes to the ovaries, so we know how much infection goes to the ovaries. In the birds, they are not vaccinated, we got 73% of the ovaries were infected. When we, vac we vaccinated with the first vaccine, it was 20%, so, and with the second vaccine, it was 7%. So we managed to reduce a 90% drop in contamination of the ovaries by using a vaccine. So, so vaccine works. Vaccine works in reducing. But vaccine does not eliminate, okay? So you can't go about going to a contaminated area and say, I'm going to use vaccine and then clear off some now. It doesn't work that way. Second one, same trial. This is uh, looking at fetal shedding, right? So we're looking at the feces. Earlier on, we we're looking at the ovaries. Now we're looking at the feces and seeing the excretion. Again, you see the same thing. There's a reduction. 
I'd like to point out to you also that you will also see a reduction as you can see in the unvaccinated flock. 14 days it was like 5, 5 and a half and 11 days has gone down to 3. But it will always remain at a low level, you never get rid of it. Okay? It, will, it, it, it will never come down to zero and that's your problem. Now that's our problem because then it's always in the flock. Not causing any problem in the flock. Right. Was it successful? This is a paper from the UK by O'Brien and what it shows here is it says the temporal relationship between vaccination program and the reduction of human disease is compelling and suggests that these programs have been a major contribution to improving the health. Public health, that means it says it worked as far as they are concerned. And here is a graph from the same paper. Uh, let me lead you through this paper. What you see here, the red one is the ST, right? The purple one is ST. And what can we see here? You see a big drop here. And at this point, they started vaccinating poultry. Can you see what happened? They were controlling all these years before without vaccination. When they implemented vaccination here, the number of human cases start to drop dramatically. Okay? Just this is so the conclusion was that poultry vaccination of SDSD helped in the cases in human. You've got also other control measures which are put as competitive exclusion using lactic acid producing bacteria, acidifiers, uh, management like transporting eggs at 7 degrees. If you don't, what happens? You transport at our temperature, the terminal grows in the egg. Or when you store the egg. Right? You've got chemicals, immersion chilling, in processing plant and so on. Right? So, now, Monitoring is very important. Why? Because you see nothing in your flock. So you need to monitor. Okay? So monitoring is an essential part of your seminar control program. And in many countries, it's under a national, it's under the framework of a national control program. Right? And when you monitor, there are several ways of monitoring. I'm not going to go into the details. There are environmental swaps, local swaps, and so on. Which one is more effective, and so on. And uh, what is important here, or what is, it, it is always causes a lot of debate here, is after monitoring, the control measures. Control measures. Right? In, in EU, you vaccinate. You do monitoring. Is positive, but off the floor. This is the problem. Okay? The monitoring is no problem. It's after getting the results, what do you do? Right? Let's say, for example, if I correct me, I'm wrong in Malaysia, the eggs that are going to Singapore are all monitored, right? And tested that they are SE free. What happens if it's positive? Do we kill the fox? No, the Malaysians eat the eggs because we are resistant to it, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, 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 is this control measures that, that that's a lot of debate because, you know, what, what do we do? The EU is very strict. The US are less strict. Okay? So, you don't have to have to kill the fox, but somebody said, okay, if you got it positive, breed the fox, you can you got layer of blocks, you don't count. You, you cannot sell the, the, the eggs. It goes into a processing where it has to be pasteurized. You still kill the salmonella. So there are, there are many ways of dealing with it. So, so this is where, you know, there's a lot of debate in how, how to control salmonella. Now, broilers, very little to be done. Huh? There's not much about broilers, salmonella and so on. It is a problem, but the eggs are a bigger problem. You can do something like this. Some places they said you do a carcass rinse. Put the carcass rinse with pattern, culture and see whether there's a manala from the carcass at the person. Some people said take 25 grams of the neck skin. And there are others also that say, oh, take, take a sample of the deep breast muscle. If you are a producer and you want to put a stamp on your chicken carcass and say salmonella tested as salmonella free, I would recommend you to do this. Right? Because contamination is on the outside, right? Okay? So the chances of you getting SE in a deep muscle is very, very small and you can do that, right? <laughs> okay? 
So be careful, huh? be careful of what people can do. So these are all the things you need to think about. Okay, let's go into post-production. What can be done? You need proper storage at proper temperature. Look at the time that you're keeping them. Poor hygiene during food preparation. Cook the eggs well. Right? Uh, 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 be aware of the risk of raw and lightly cooked food. Now, the control of some, uh, again, I said, it's a food bond problem. It's a problem until the guy eats it and gets, you know, gets diarrhea and so on. So, the process of SA control still, is still valid in the kitchen. So, one of the ways that's been recommended, you've got a separate chopping board and knife for your meat and for your vegetables. And even for your cooked food. Now, how many of us have that in our house? You've got one chopping board, one knife, and you do everything there. Right? And you said you wash, everything is good. Not really, okay? We put our meat, we put everything into the freezer together with the ice cream and so on. So you may actually get some of that, right? Problem because you eat salad. Why? I use my knife to cut the chicken. I cook my chicken curry very well. I don't get salmonella infection from there. But and now I have this fact of eating raw salad, right? Today. Now the, the less you cook your, your vegetables, the more healthy it is. It's got more vitamins, but it also got more anti infect there. Right? And you use the same knife, and then you get diarrhea. Right? So contamination in food processing is also very important. Processing plant. Sorry, you can't see this. I uh, hope that uh, we don't have uh, just the uh, gel consumers here. This is what the chickens go through. Right? This is a scalding plant. You know, you put and it's cold so that you can remove the feathers, but I'm sorry, you can't see. You can't you can see all this chicken shit that's here. Okay? Now, when you're going to the scalding pan, you need the water to move. If the water doesn't move, you're dipping all your chickens in feces contaminated hot water. Right? You, hear, you see here contamination of the intestine. So this is the other thing. Because it goes in the processing plant, where is the salmonella? Let's say it's not on, 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 on the surface, where is it? It's inside the intestine. In the processing plant, when the machine goes in and drags out all the intestine, it, if it breaks, what happens? The bird gets contaminated. Right? And here you can see feces here, and what you see here is, you can see this intestine is flat. It's flat. Huh? And we do this by stop feeding the birds maybe seven hours before it goes to the processing plant. If you feed it until it's time to go to the processing plant, you're going to have problems. Because it's full of food, right? And it's not flat. And when they process it, the intestine breaks. And it contaminates the bird. Right. Uh, there are also other things that you can do in the processing plant. A lot of some places you can use uh, chlorine to disinfect. Right, bring down the levels, but then you have to be careful with the pH of, of, of because chlorine only works in uh, more acidic pH and so on. So there are ways that you can do. A little bit uh, to finish on human perspective, SE in Malaysian, sorry. What you see here is, this is a serotype here in a study that's been done. And it's very, first of all, it's very difficult to get SE data in Malaysia because uh, not much of it exists. You can see SD here, number one, right? SD seems to be number one here, right? And titanium here is way down at number four. But what is also interesting, I'd like you to know, is that this is non typhoidal phenomena. Apparently, from what I've read, is that the bigger problem in Malaysia is the human salmonella. Nothing to do with SD. It's salmonella typhi. That is a bigger problem for the Ministry of Health than this SD, right? And here is also uh, an extract from a paper which says that half of the food one uh, related diseases from the early 1990s outbreak in institutions and schools. And we say, yes, we read this paper. Some schools suddenly 30, 40 people, uh, students went into the hospital, right? And it's identified by other sources in sanitary food handling procedures. Causes 50% of the cases. 
hygiene, status, and cleanliness of food handlers. So apparently in Malaysia, this is the bigger problem. No one has started to say, okay, SE is a big problem. And I feel that until we can control this very well, no one is going to really look into SE. Okay? Because the main problem of foodborne diseases doesn't come from, from SE. Again, if you look here, incidence of cases of waterborne and foodborne diseases, look at this. This is typhoid. This is not SE. Typhoid is a bigger problem, cholera, dysentery, hepatitis A. So where does SE figure out in our Malaysian context? Huh? I leave it to discussion. Uh, some lessons, again, I'm going to finish off with some lessons. This is from the FDA, the, uh, CDC in uh, the, the US. They have several outbreaks, and I um, just want to put everything into perspective here. And the first one, how to prevent some uh, uh, problems in human beings. Risky eggs, we know that. We have just been discussing about that. Peanut butter, they get outbreaks from peanut butter. Totally, salmonella is not just a chicken problem, it's everywhere. From peanut butter, so that they have problems and they have this prevention. Turkeys, distribution contaminated ice cream. Why? Trucks hauling raw eggs, then ice cream. Causes people, 200,000 people to be sick. Preparation in restaurants as a source of outbreaks and also in food, whether and at the home as well. So it, it, it's, it's not all about chicken, chicken, chicken and that's our job. It's, a, it's everybody's job. Now, so I've talked about you, we all, or the farm getting some now from all this, whether it's rodents, feed and so on. And we have seen also that we can control and this control formula, right, with the other methods, with the methods that are shown here, right. So in conclusion, SE is a public health issue, it's not a chicken issue, poultry and eggs are very important as far as SE is concerned. There are many sources of contamination, not only in poultry, how important it is in Malaysia compared to the EU is for us to discuss. Control involves farm intervention post-production intervention, consumer education, and we need to consider the economics of SE. I think this is, uh, and some are free or some are control. Do you just control to minimize the level, or do you want it completely free? Now, uh, I think this is the last slide, yes, and I'd just like to leave with uh, one note here, and that note was by Tan Sri Bamji, who says when he was talking in the opening speech, and it says that we are looking to be fair to the consumer, but we also got to be fair to the producer. Okay? Uh, I think we can produce salmonella eggs, free eggs, very. I'm sure the technology is there, but are we willing to pay the price on an egg which the Singaporeans are paying? Are we willing to do that? But we cannot pay the price that we are paying in Malaysia and want it to be salmonella free. The only way you can get that salmonella, that price is now the salmonella free eggs, because we give salmonella for free to the eggs. We don't charge the, the consumer for that, right? So, so, so if you want a real salmonella free eggs, you've got to pay premium for it, right? I think this is how we need to look at it. Salmonella free control, I think it's generally, from my experience, it doesn't come from the farmer, right? But it will come two ways. One way is the government says that, okay, we need to do something about it, we need to have a framework, we need to you know, have this whole process. The other thing will come when you're, when from the consumers. Let's say a big hypermarket comes and says, oh, if you're going to supply me eggs, if McDonald's comes and says, if you're going to supply me this, I want to see a formula program. Then you have to do it. But I don't think it will voluntarily always come from the you know, producer and say, oh, I'm going to control something because there's no benefit as far as he's concerned, okay, unless he gets a premium price for his product. I think that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Now, we have time for questions and answers. And questions from the floor? Yes, Dr. Yes, Dr. The data showing that even though it's minimum that SD contaminated public health is considered low as compared with IP, which is by point. Do we have any data in Singapore public health? 
I'm sorry, I don't have the data here. I didn't look that one up. Right. Uh, but, okay, this is my opinion, is that uh, Singapore is always Singapore, right? Uh, we've got the word Kiasu, right there. And, and I think a lot of Singapore is that, uh, because you've got to look at whether they're developed or they, they consider themselves a developed country, and which I think they are. So a lot of my dealings with Singapore is that they are looking a lot on the West. So they see what has been done in EU, they see what's been done in, in, in US, more in EU, and they say, okay, we want this. And they're doing it. Whether it makes sense or not, I put a question mark. I really put a question mark in some of the things they do. Because right now they say to you, okay, I want X. It's not only free or salmonella. I want it to be salmonella antibodies free. They find it, there's a way that they can say, if I got antibodies inside, that means your block is infected. And then, that precludes now the, the use of vaccination in the layers. You can't vaccinate the layers. Right? So you only have biosecurity control to, to, to actually maintain your flock free. So I think sometimes in Singapore, uh, because they, they don't really grow, they don't really grow any animals. Huh? Uh, and, uh, and, and so they, they put a lot of imposition on the producers and say they want this. And uh, I will say this because they've got, I think, five farms. Five farms, uh, two or three layer farms. Uh, okay, there's no Singaporeans here, right? <laughs> and they put a lot of and, and, and now they got one of the farms got some enough, right? And they don't know what to do. And then they're beginning to find out, oh, it's not so easy, huh? It's not so easy to get it. Uh, yeah, it's not so easy. So they are struggling yeah, to, to handle the situation. Personally, uh, they consult me and says uh, they are not handling it properly. They don't really, but they impose on us as a consumer and say this is what they want. So I don't think that that's a problem. But again, in Singapore, uh, uh, you are very safe. I think their food, food safety is very, very high. They are very clean compared to us. Now, if you can go to a hawker store or whatever, they are extremely clean. You know? Uh, or I'll put a goes in and eat anywhere one won't force it, but I don't think that will happen here. Uh, so, so, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you for informing me. I always thought that they were paying premium for it. But then the question would be why would you want to have all these measures and get the same price? Huh? That's something that. Uh, but of course, Singapore always plays a game of their business people. They're very good business people. Any more questions from the floor? If not, I would like to thank Dr. Mike. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Joseph Garcia from Barcelona, Spain. And then uh, his education background, he won a PhD in animal science. And